Welcome to a very special archived edition of People of the Free Gift Teaching Through the Bible. And that means it could range anywhere from current day to 10 years ago. And so this is People of the Free Gift, where we grab believers in their identity in Christ and equip them to reach those caught in religion. We're glad you joined us. And if you're new here, go ahead and subscribe to the channel and enable notifications so you won't miss any of our teachings through the Bible, which we release at least once a week and many times several times a week. And so we're so glad that you joined us. say no doubt lived as a person, but to the extent of what he did, I'm not sure. I think of walking into where I work uh, shows me the signs of the, uh, the stigmata and tells me he's a son of uh, God. I might start believing. I don't, don't believe in God, first of all. Um, maybe because I grew up in like an age of science. I have a lot of different thoughts and theories on, on Jesus, and, and but I, I don't think coming back from the dead is really, really possible. <laughs> Gets them every time. I don't know how many of us in this room resonate with the sentiments just expressed in that video, in that short clip, um, or how many of us come from families that have generation upon generation of believers, where Easter Sunday means we gather together as God's people in God's house to celebrate the resurrection. But I imagine that many of us, if we were asked the question, why? Do we believe in the resurrection? Do we really believe that it was a historical event? That it really happened? That three days after being crucified, that Jesus rose from the tomb, stripped off his linen cloths, and rolled away the stone, and the tomb was empty? Do we really believe that? And what reason could we possibly have for believing such a preposterous thing? Such as that guy expressed that I don't think it's really possible for someone to really rise from the dead. Especially for someone to rise from the dead and to go out convincing over 500 people that he was truly risen when his body was so badly disfigured just three days earlier. And something happened after the resurrection. Luke tells us that two disciples were on the road down to Emmaus, and this stranger, or what they thought was a stranger, appeared next to them and started talking with them and started asking them why they were so sad. And they said, where have you been, fella? We've been followers of Jesus for three years now. And we thought that he was the promised one. We thought he was the Messiah that God had (coughs) promised so many times and so long ago. But three days ago, we saw him hung on a Roman cross. And he died. And then Jesus says to them, How foolish you are, and how slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Did not the Christ have to suffer these things, and then enter his glory? And it says, And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he explained to them what was said in all the scriptures concerning himself. What a Bible study that would have been, to actually have Jesus explain the entire Old Testament to us, and everything that pointed to him over several hours. In the book of Acts, just before he ascends into heaven, we're told, after his suffering, he showed himself to these men and gave many convincing proofs that he was alive. He appeared to them over a period of 40 days and spoke to them about the kingdom of God. 
And then we're told of the Apostle Paul who would go into the synagogues wherever he went and reason with the Jewish people from their scriptures, proving that Jesus was the Christ. So it's not irrational for us as believers to want some evidence for the things that we believe. It's not irrational for those who come up to us and don't know about Jesus and don't believe in Jesus to demand some evidence. If we claim that, his, that Christianity is a historical faith, then there must be some kind of imprints left behind. Something that we can back our faith by. Something that we can base it on. Something that will stand the test of time. And so there's four things I want to take us to the courtroom today a little bit and examine the evidence. Is there any evidence that Jesus really rose from the, from the grave? And the first exhibit, exhibit A, is the empty tomb. You see, Matthew tells us that some women followers of Jesus went to the tomb that Sunday morning, not because they were expecting to find an empty tomb. They were expecting to go and anoint the body of Jesus to finish a proper burial that would give him honor and to show their love for him. But as they were going to the tomb, I imagine that they must have turned to each other and said, who is going to, what are we going to do about the stone? You see, in front of the tomb in which Jesus was placed was a stone. And we're not talking just a little stone that you pick up on the side of the road. We're talking a three to 4,000 pound massive block of stone that had a Roman seal on it. And a Roman seal meant do not touch, do not enter, do not cross this line. And if you do, you will die. No one dare move a Roman seal. Much less could two women or three women move such a massive stone uphill away from the tomb. Nor could they deal with six Roman soldiers that were placed to stand guard. You see, the religious leaders, the Jewish religious leaders, even after they saw Jesus crucified and put in a tomb, they were still worried about him. Because Jesus had gone around telling people that he was going to be killed and rise again from the dead. And so they went to Pontius Pilate and made a very special request. They said, we need security in front of the tomb of Jesus. Because this guy said he was going to rise from the dead, and we're afraid his disciples are going to come and try and steal the body and hide it, and then try and fool everybody. So they did. They placed several Roman soldiers, men trained for war, by the rulers of the world. Men who, if they let a prisoner go free, they would suffer death. These are not men that would be sleeping on the job, nor would they just let somebody through just because they wanted to honor the dead. And after the tomb was found empty, the guards, the Roman guards that were placed there, they went to the Jewish religious leaders and they said, help us. Because they were afraid for their life. They were running. They were scared. And the Jewish leaders were told in Matthew's gospel that the chief priests had met with the elders and devised a plan. They gave the soldiers a large sum of money, telling them, you are to say his disciples came during the night and stole him away while we were asleep. If this report gets to the governor, we will satisfy him and keep you out of trouble. So the soldiers took the money and did as they were instructed. And this story has been widely circulated among the Jews to this very day. 
And even in the Jewish writings that came after the time of Christ, you can find this story placed there. This is the story that has come up through the centuries of what happened to the body of Jesus. The disciples stole the body. But again, I propose to you that it is absurd for a group of fishermen to take on Roman centurions, to break a Roman seal, to take the linen cloths off of the body of Jesus, and to go and hide his body somewhere where it would never be found again. And then go on, every single one of them, to die for the faith that they knew to be a lie. I just can't, I don't have enough faith to believe in that story. But the religious leaders did something for us with the story that they were telling the soldiers to tell. They were verifying for us that the tomb was empty. They were verifying for us that nobody could find the body of Jesus. They were verifying for us the fact that somehow, amidst the Roman seal, amongst the large stone, amongst all the Roman soldiers that were placed there, that tomb was empty that Sunday morning, that first Easter morning. And so we must explain away the empty tomb. But secondly, we must find a reason to explain the appearances of Jesus. Lee Strobel quoted J.I. Packer in his book, book God's Outrageous Claims. And J.I. Packer said this, if we were to call to the witness stand every witness who personally encountered the resurrected Jesus, and we cross-examined them for only 15 minutes. And if we run around, went around the clock without a break, we would be listening to first-hand testimony for more than 128 hours. That's over five days' worth of testimony. Who could possibly walk away unconvinced? Could you imagine a trial it, that you were sitting on the jury or even sitting in the audience, in which either side just called up witness after witness after witness after witness after witness, even at 15 minutes apiece, and it went on for five days, and they all told different aspects of the story, but every single one of their stories backed each other up. There was no disagreements. Could you imagine sitting on a jury... And then going into the room and having every single person in the jury go and it ruling against the eyewitness testimony. It, it just, I can't imagine that happening. And if it did happen, there would be a revolt, I would imagine, in this country if we knew about it. And that's exactly what happened with Jesus. And in 1 Corinthians... 15, the Apostle Paul says, After that, he appeared to more than 500 of the brothers at the same time, most of whom are still living, though some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles, and last of all, he appeared to me also, as to one abnormally born. And Paul is telling, referring to over 500 people who saw Jesus all at once, And he says most of these people are still living. At the time he was writing this, most of the people who were eyewitnesses of Jesus were still living. And he says, if you don't believe the story that I'm telling you, if you don't believe the message I'm telling you, then you can go ask him for yourself. They're around. Find one of them. You probably know several of them. Go ask for yourself. And they'll tell you exactly what I have told you. Third, we have to deal with the message that was preached. And this comes about in several ways. You see, the Old Testament is all a foreshadowing of Jesus coming to die for our sins. Ever since Adam and Eve ate of the fruit in the garden and sin was entered into our world, 
into the human race. God from that moment proclaimed that there would be a Messiah, a Savior, one who would come in our behalf to deal with our sins. And the whole Old Testament is filled with prophecies, over 300 that Jesus fulfilled specifically in his lifetime. But concerning the resurrection, we find that the apostles, after it happened, they started reading their Old Testament with new eyes. And they started reading the Psalms of David and seeing that it told them that the Messiah was going to die and that he was going to rise from the dead. The story of Jonah was picked up by Jesus when he says, in Matthew 12, the religious leaders were giving Jesus a hard time and saying, look, you're saying all these different things about yourself. You're saying you're the son of God. You're saying you're the Messiah. You're saying you have all these powers. You can do miracles. Well, tell us. We want to see a miraculous sign from you. Which the funny thing about that is most of the time when they asked this question, it was usually after Jesus did several miracles in a row. And they say, show us a sign. And he says, a wicked and adulterous generation asks for a miraculous sign, but none will be given it except the sign of the prophet Jonah. For as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of a huge fish, so the Son of Man will be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. He said on another occasion, speaking of the temple, referring to his body, destroy this temple and I'll rebuild it in three days. For no one has the ability to take my life unless it's granted, unless I lay it down myself, and I have the ability to take it back again, even if I die. And then there's the message of the angel that first Sunday morning. He isn't here. He is risen from the dead, just as he has said would happen. Come see where his body was lying. And then the message of the apostles shortly after the resurrection. 50 days after the resurrection and 10 days after Jesus ascended into heaven, the disciples were gathered and it says the Holy Spirit came upon them and several people were gathered outside as Peter goes and he delivers the message. And the message was centered around Jesus and it was centered around the historical fact that the tomb was empty and that Jesus rose from the dead and that all our hope is based off of that fact. Where was he preaching this message? In the city of Jerusalem. In the city where the events took place. Just after they had taken place. At any time during the message, someone could have stood up and said any number of things. They could have said, Peter, you're misunderstanding those Old Testament prophecies. Let me correct you. They could have said, Jesus wasn't crucified as you say he was. They, couldn't, they could have said that Jesus wasn't buried. And especially because they were claiming a very specific tomb, Joseph of Arimathea a member of the religious council that voted to put Jesus to death. They could have claimed the tomb isn't empty, or they could have just produced the body. At any time, they could have done any one of these things, but no one could, because the tomb was empty. And Jesus had appeared to all these people. And now the message was going out, and people, people's lives were changing which is Exhibit D, the change. You see, the women weren't going to the tomb that morning to find an empty tomb. They weren't going to meet the resurrected Jesus. The men, after they heard the women's message, were not expecting to see Jesus risen from the dead. In fact, where were the men, the followers of Jesus, the loyal, the twelve, where were they? They were locked in a room, waiting for the Roman soldiers to come knocking and for themselves to be hanging on Roman crosses as well, 
for treason to the Roman government. But what happens three days later and after the disciples see Jesus and for another 40 days he shows himself to them and he he teaches them? What happens to these guys? We find Peter standing up on the day of Pentecost, preaching a message and saying very bluntly, you crucified Jesus. But God raised him from the dead. This group that was locked in a room for fear of death now suddenly was going all over the world, full of the Holy Spirit and changing lives. People were coming to faith in Jesus all over the place. But more than that, these men that followed Jesus, they all died as martyrs, except for John, who they Legend tells us that they tried to kill and he wouldn't die. All of these men died for Jesus because Jesus hadn't just risen from a tomb, he had risen in them. And he had brought about a change that no one can bring about of their own efforts, or nor should they try, because it's not possible. Only Jesus can come in and cleanse the human heart. Only he can give a new heart. And I don't know where any of you are in this room today, for sure. But if you haven't considered the reasons why Christians believe that Jesus rose from the dead, then I challenge you to consider them, to really think through it, To really ask yourself, can I really come up with any other explanation for any of these things except for the fact that Jesus really rose from the dead and that tomb was empty and it still is. And that that same Jesus lives within those who believe in him and put their faith in him and have surrendered their lives to follow him. And the offer of forgiveness of sins is available to all today. And it's simply for the asking, because he's done all the work. He finished it. He died for our sins, and three days later, he rose from the dead. It's true, every single word of it. You can take it to the bank. In fact, you can take it to the eternal bank. And if the Holy Spirit is speaking to you this morning, if he's tugging at your heart, then please don't turn your back on him. Don't leave this room without surrendering. Just laying down your defenses, laying down your arguments, and just surrendering. And ask him to come in and change you. The same change that happened in these men that were feared, afraid, and lock themselves in a room, that same change can happen in any one of us in this room this morning. And I pray and I am confident that it will. Amen.